Okay, um, so it's my pleasure and honor to start this panel discussion. Um, we have four guests, which I will shortly introduce to you. Many of you probably know um, our guests, and many of them already, but I want to give some introductory notes. Um, the panel will be about humanistic transformation, the conference theme, and all of the panelists have their own relation to this issue, and we hope to have a fruitful and inspiring discussion together. Um, we will begin after my introduction with a short introductory statement by the panelists um, and then have a discussion within the panel. And in the last half an hour, half hour roundabout, we will open this for questions um, for you from, from, from the round as well. Okay, so I start um, on the left. This is Professor Dr. Gesine Schwan. Um, she was for a long time Professor of Political Science at the FU Berlin, uh, public university here in, in Berlin. She's the president of the Humboldt Viadrina Governance Platform. She is um, a politician in the party of SPD and, uh, if I'm right informed, chair of the SPD Fundamental Values Commission. Um, she is former president of the Viadrina University in Frankfurt Oder. Um, she is in Germany very famous as she was twice candidate for the office of the federal presidency and she won, and this is of course the most important, 2013 the Eric Fromm Prize. For her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We're happy, very happy that you are here. Then um, to my left we have um, Professor Dr. Harald Welzer. Um, he is a sociologist and social psychologist. He is co-founder and director of the foundation Futur 2, Future 2 um, <laughs> Foundation. Um, he's Future all, Perfect. Future Perfect. You would have to explain this later, how, how, we, <laughs> how we need this and, and come to it. He's also speaker of the Rat für Digitale Ökologie, Council for Digital Ecology. He's a permanent visiting professor at the University of St. Gallen and head of the Norbert Elias Center for Transformation Design at the University of Flensburg, my hometown. And he is author of numerous books on social political issues, particularly sustainability. His books have been published in 22 languages. And he is also currently editor of Tats Futsu 2, a magazine on future and politics. And currently he's very famous for his latest book, I think very much in, in media and discussion. So. It's a special honor that you have found the time to come to us as well. Thank you very much. I know you must be very, very busy as a real public <laughs> sociologist, as we have discussed here. Then to my right is my, um, yeah, I can say friend as well, Thomas Brun. Um, he leads the transdisciplinary research group Transformative Spaces and Mindsets at the Research Institute for Sustainability, which was formerly the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. His work is dedicated to the role of mental models and mindsets, such as mindfulness and compassion, in the transformation towards sustainability, so right in the topic of humanistic transformation. He's also a trained facilitator in various group formats and an expert in collective learning and co-creativity, uh, including at the UNFCCCC climate conferences. And for me, the most important to deepen his competencies <laughs> He's continuing his education in psychodynamic counseling and systemic leadership since 2019 at the famous University of IPU Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> and not to mention he's a member of the Presidium of the German Society of the Club of Rome. <laughs> and we have Gerd Hofielen, who already joined us yesterday for the talk of Harten Rosa. Um, he's director and founder of Humanistic Management Practices, a company which defines itself from the website as a not only think tank, but a doing think tank based in Berlin. Um, he's an internationally experienced management expert. He works with companies to embed novel ways of thinking and acting into their corporate culture. And um, from the website, he says it's about promoting, disseminating and exploring humanistically inspired ethics and environmental sustainability in economy, striving for eco-fair businesses that aim for the common good are equipped for the future and help to solve global problems. So I think we have a very diverse and interesting panel here, all with um, relations to humanistic transformation. And um, I have combined with all that they have around five minutes, and I will be very strict because we want to have a discussion for an initial statement, um, where it would be nice if you give some comments on your relation to humanistic transformation. And 
I don't know, maybe we can start in the order I, I presented, if you want. <laughs> and I, I will advise, I will be, when time is over, please. <laughs> right. So thank you very much for having invited me and I'm very happy to be with you and very curious what will come out of the discussion. I will start, if you permit it, with a citation. This is it. Overall, humanistic transformation is a holistic approach to personal development that empowers individual, individuals to become more self-aware, compassionate and fulfilled, leading to a greater sense of well-being and a deeper understanding of themselves and others. I don't know if you know the author, probably not, because this citation stems from the lunch of today, where the American family of my husband uh, asked me what I will be doing in the afternoon. And I told them what I will be doing. And they said, well, let's, hear, let's see what ChatGPT tells about it. <laughs> so this is the result within half a minute of ChatGPT. It is not totally unintelligent, we have to say. But I mean, I found it very curious to see that. <coughs> I won't follow ChatGPT, but uh, you wanted me to say something about my understanding of humanistic transformation. Transformation is a term which is uh, discussed everywhere, of course, also in our Commission for Basic Values or Fundamental Values, especially with the connection of social ecological transformation. And as far as we see, this transformation faces two main challenges. The one is the insecure, from the political point of view, the one is the insecurity which stems from change in transformation and which uh, tends to create anxiety, aggression, resentment. And the other challenge is injustice in the sense of that what the changes of transformation will create advantages for the ones and disadvantages for others. And the results or the psychological followings, which you are much more uh, uh, knowledgeable about than I am, but the, the consequences very often the psychological are the same as for anxiety and fear. So the political question in the frame of which we are discussing that is how to overcome these two problems. Well, and the idea is, uh, my answer to is, is by a well thought through, and I underlined well thought through, political participatory strategy, mainly on the level of municipalities. And so I will try to talk about uh, the uh, uh, humanistic transformation in that sense and try to contribute a certain aspect. Uh, the chance for individuals and groups to get an own uh, authentic insight into the process of transformations is the most important reason why I take participation uh, for a, a very important way how to overcome the challenges. Uh, this, if you are, uh, if you are asked and invited to promote transformation, socio-ecological transformation, on the level of your municipality, which is the most transparent area and arena of political action, then you have the chance to understand step by step what is meant by this transformation and to influence it and also to work together with others. It means understanding, losing part of the fear, influence it and work together with others. The chance is also by this shaping to influence the general uh, flow of transformation by your own insights, by your interests, and to reach a just information. The process of mutual understanding and common identification with the project of transformation brings people together. We have uh, had a number of projects in that sense. We means uh, NGO, which I am the head of since several years and which has now changed the name, which is not anymore Humboldt Viadrina um, Governance Platform, but it's simply Governance Berlin Governance Platform, but you couldn't know. That is just recent. So uh, this process, um, we, have, uh, went, we have gone through this process and we have in fact experienced how much a group of people in the famous German town Herne, which is in the Ruhrgebiet, 
uh, which was co very controversial in, in the interior composition and which finally after about five months and four very challenging heavy sessions from nine to five in the afternoon that were not used to do that so such a long time, they found a common scenario, a common criteria set, etc., for the transformation for important ground in the city Herne, and they came together, which did not happen for about six or seven years. So, and this process really uh, uh, furthered and strengthened uh, mutual understanding um, in the final turn of, or the final the, the result of the, of the participants of the process, they said, we found out, A, we are not that far from each other that we thought. We found out, B, B that we have uh, gained uh, trust to each other and we have found out that we can really process in common. And this is, which I, in my view, is a humanistic way of transformation. Uh, it can, this tr humanistic transformation can be uh, denied or supported by social and political circumstances, uh, circumstances. And I do think that there is an affinity to Fromm's idea of, of humanistic transformation and also uh, in the sense, for instance, that uh, he presupposes, as far as I understand, that there is such thing as a human nature uh, which you cannot grasp uh, totally and clearly, but uh, there is not just people are not just totally cult cultural indifferent, and but they have a certain uh, set of needs, a certain set of uh, experiences which would, would help them to to lead a fulfilled life, uh, and this is what one has to strengthen, of course, and to support in the political and social life, and which is, in my view, also the normative aim of humanistic transformation. That means transformation uh, in favor of the the uh, development of people of the social society in the sense of constructive re reaction of of uh, empathy etc and so i would say the idea which what uh, um, what is it i never can expose this, this is h ChatGBT. The idea of ChatGBT is not that bad. I, I think, of course, it is not really an uh, um, uh, exhausting um, uh, definition, but uh, I would uh, end up with my five minutes. I am the, have the impression that there are now already five and a half minutes. Uh, humanistic transformation would be a normative term, which suggests that the process of Transformation favors needs of human nature and contributes to a peaceful and just transformation with, a little, with as little as possible anxiety and fear and aggression. That is what I would like to present. Thank you very much. Uh, when I say five minutes, <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a metaphor. Yeah, then. Okay. Uh, thank you in, for inviting me. Um, I want to start with a brief remark on my research fields um, because um, it is necessary to understand my approach to questions like um, this humanistic transformation because I did a great body of work on violence research, especially on mass violence, on societal crimes and things like that. And the main result of this body of research is that it's much more the, the societal reference frame and the situations that would bring people to do certain things independently of their individual psychological conditions. This is very important to understand because we have, of course, a long tradition of investigating biographies, uh, processes of socialization, specific types of perpetrators and things like that. But I think all what we knew hints to the uh, depressing point that most of the people also in this room or on this podium would be able to do things under certain conditions where they would completely refuse the idea that they would ever do something like this. So 
The other body of my work is exactly the opposite, because at a certain point of time, I didn't want to do this type of research anymore because it's ugly, it's mean. You don't want to spend your life with, this, <laughs> with these things. And um, if the idea is right, that it's much more the, the societal reference frame and the situations, then it's also valid for the potentials that people can develop and positive uh, potentials that people can, can develop under other conditions. And this is quite interesting because then my research, my investigations are aimed to, to, to find these conditions where people can do something, where people can develop something also in, um, in this term of humanistic transformation. And now comes the crucial point, um, taking the history of modern democracy, uh, taking the history of liberalization of living conditions, of uh, establishing societal frameworks that enable people to be free, to have their own competence of uh, judgments of Urteilsfähigkeit, of autonomy and things like that, to my opinion, is really a necessary condition for acting in a humanistic way. This is extremely important. But reality shows that this kind of development uh, as a progress to establish more and more societies of this type, more democracies, more liberal societies, is in the moment a process of regress. And we have, unfortunately, uh, less and less democracies in the world and less and less free societies in a strict sense. So the optimism that I had for many years that despite of of regressions deep, despite of uh, disillusions of this and that type, my, I was convinced that slowly we develop our type of societies and make it possible to have something like a global diffusion of these ideas of humanism, of democracy, of liberalism, of universalism, very important. And now, in the moment, I feel really a great, great, great regression. A really great re uh, regression, but this is not only, uh, to my impression, it's not only due to global or geopolitical processes, but as soon as they happen in a certain way, it is infusing the conditions in the given democratic societies, for example, like Germany, when, when we see processes of remilitarization, not only in terms of money that is put into yeah, the armies and things like that, and in the industry building these things, but also in the type of language, in the type of dualistic approaches, um, uh, losing ambivalence uh, abilities and all these things. So that to my um, great surprise, I did a lot of work of what I call shifting baselines, how people change their, uh, their, what they are convinced of, what they, what they think they are. It's really, if you take societies like the National Socialist Society or Communist Societies, you will see that people can change their mindsets very, very quickly, although they think they are still the same, but they, they, they are convinced of totally different things. And I would never have expected to experience something like this in full color and real time. And this is what is happening now. And this makes me very, very um, um, pessimistic about the conditions of a humanistic transformation in the moment. And I don't want to leave it with this, with this depression, <laughs> depressive statement, but I think we have to face it that we that we are continuously, constantly in the condition that that what was achieved by societal, for social movements, by societal uh, fightings, all these things that was achieved is never, never secured. 
it is always in danger. And maybe, I hope I'm wrong, but in the moment I think uh, it is really a kind of crucial situation because many, many things seem to be very regressive to my point of view. Sorry for saying this, but maybe chat GBT has some better uh, news for you. Well, we're starting only the discussion. Maybe in the end we can <laughs> convince. Okay, Thomas. Yeah, hello everyone. You all have chosen to be here instead of being outside in the warm sunshine. And uh, I hope that our exchange here can somehow be enriching for us in I would say our shared concern about humanistic transformation, that's why we're here. And at the same time, um, when you invited me to join, I wondered, how much can I add to an understanding about humanistic uh, transformation? Um, I feel I rather would like to share a little bit of my approach towards how to live humanistic transformation in those moments where I experience some form of self-efficacy in between. Because in many situations, I agree with what you said, there are, the, there are conditions that might really prevent me from being effective in catalyzing humanistic transformations. But what I might be able to contribute here a little bit is my, my journey of trying to live humanistic transformation, trying to understand it as I live it, but somehow at the same time always failing, I would say. Um, my... I would say the experience that shapes me and that has chosen, cho made me choose to also join the IPU at some point was that I worked with people who care about socio-ecological transformation in a humanistic way. And at the same time, the repeated experience was that there was no way to really interact in a humanistic way. <laughs> that was a really strange dichotomy that obviously there was a shared concern, but the chance to relate in a way that can invite the humanistic dimension, so to say, was absent. P instead, people entered the room and talked ab about something, seemed to agree, but actually they ended up fighting each other and tried to convince each other what is the right way towards something. There was a terrible time, a terrible frustration, working with good-hearted people ending up in totally dysfunctional communication. So. I was a physicist back then. You, you didn't mention I, I'm coming as a very stranger into this house, so to say. Um, coming from physics with nothing more but my genuine care about the well-being of the planet, including human and non-human life, and at the same time finding myself in a situation that cannot be understood as very sustainable, not very fit for the future, so to say, both in a human and in a non-human way. Um, and so my learning and what brought me back to my interest in From that has its root back when I was 14 was that as much as there might be an understanding how humanistic transformation and how good relationships, how authenticity, etc. could look like, doesn't mean that this is also the way how people who are in a certain role can also act accordingly. That that the understanding itself and what people can live with each other, what maybe the five of us in this moment can live with each other, might, might be quite disconnected. That's the challenge that I feel I'm facing every day uh, in my life. And my interest is in how to design spaces that enable people to relate authentically, although that's not what they might be trained with. Um, to give you an example, I'm just returning from a, from a gathering in Iceland uh, called the Spirit of Humanity Forum. And basically it was a, a, tr a retreat kind of event. It used to be a conference for many years, but uh, for decision makers from all kinds of backgrounds, primarily political, but not only, um, and invited um, decision makers to share their personal stories and how do you live what you care about in, in a sort of safe space, in a, in a somewhat safe environment. But it's so, it was so apparent how everybody who came to this forum was so much suffering from being stuck in a system that actually makes them lose their connection to their own humaneness, so to say. The conditions, however, like cr creating a certain intimacy, and we're not talking about a therapeutic setting here, yet it's kind of, it's safe, safe space in unsafe environment, you could say. Everybody brings their own experience of unsafety with them. If you're saying, are you an enemy? You come from that organization or that organization, yeah? Oh, you have that agenda. 
everything that I feel makes, makes a change and might be a catalyst to a humanistic transformation is helping people to get in touch with their own humaneness before anything else happens. And that is so challenging because, I mean, it's, it's so normal that we enter a room as carriers of roles, so to say. And when you have 20 people in a room and you do a round of introductions and then you have like all the dozens heads of everybody in the room, I feel the human dimension has no space. So that's what, what I would kind of want to bring as a question into our conversation. I feel the understanding about humanistic transformation is one thing, but I feel there's not so much that I feel urgent to be added to that understanding. For me, the real question is, how can we meet as humans in whatever setting we meet, where we try to be effective in the spirit of humanistic transformation, being human with each other? That may sound so simple, but I, I've, that's what guides my question for the last 12 years, and I feel it's going to take another couple of dozen years. Um, yeah, that's what I want to invite us to, uh, to reflect a little about, that practice of humanistic transformation, being human while the conditions may not necessarily be so inviting and so safe. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And... Okay. A couple of years I have decided to be neither optimist nor pessimist, and I have decided to be a humanist. <laughs> Uh, because I cannot bother with the course of the, of the globe, of the entire planet. I have to do within my um, range of responsibility, whatever I can do, to contribute to a humanistic transformation. And you started to plan this conference a year ago, I heard from you yesterday. And exactly a year ago, I started together with a couple of uh, uh, colleagues to uh, we, we started a new company by the name of Humanistic Transformation Limited. <laughs> Our aim is to encourage companies to redesign or remodel or modify their business plans and their business practices in the face of what's necessary to be able to start this transformation with people because it needs to be driven, invented and driven by people and at the same time, uh, in the same process, people will probably change their own mindset. And that is what we have to do on a larger scale. One of the pillars of my thinking is uh, this, uh, let's say, in, insight, insight of Immanuel Kant who talks about the human as a thing in itself and as a thing for itself. That I find very important because the human as a thing in itself is driven by instinct and desire, to be short. And you see it outside the number of SUVs. Many people are driven, most of the people I would say are driven by instinct and desire, while at the same time the human has the potential to be a thing for itself and that means take decisions uh, with regard to responsible and reasonable thinking. And that is our opportunity and our potential to free ourselves from traditions, from, uh, from well, desires that are no longer adequate for the era where we live in. But at the same time, uh, I am also uh, knowledgeable, and may, you might be as well, Lawrence Kohlberg has created steps of uh, moral development and he has uh, researched that one, sl one sliver of the population is able to identify with uh, a thing like a, a, a societal contract, which means that everybody in society should get their just uh, they're just share of everything, justice, education, uh, nourishment, housing. So that would be the societal contract. And the next step in moral development would be an adherence to universal principles like human rights. And Kohlberg has already back then identified that only a small minority of people are capable and uh, what maybe willing, I don't know, capable of achieving those echelons uh, of 
uh, understanding that we need a social contract and we need to adhere to universal principles of well-being for everybody. So, coming from this understanding that the human has the potential for free, responsible acting, understanding as well and taking into account that will always only be a minority who takes the, the nettle and challenges existing structures, uh, we have come to the conclusion that we need to start small, with a small number of people, and start at the same time with a big thought, how could we transform companies so that they would perform according to values like human rights, uh, social justice, solidarity, ecological sustainability, and democratic participation. And that movement, I am part of it, is called uh, Economy for the Common Good, in German Gemeinwohlökonomy, and this is what we do with companies. And I, we believe that by working with companies uh, and uh, helping them to achieve these values or create their own decisions and practices by contributing to these values, we are able to challenge capitalism in its single-minded profit orientation and we are capable to transform companies into entities that really contribute to the well-being of large parts of society, uh, in society. And it's a never-ending story and there is reason to be pessimistic and there is some hope as well. We are mainly working with mid-sized owner, family-owned uh, companies. We don't really stand a chance to penetrate the large cap uh, capitalist uh, market, although we are now indeed talking to one of the large automotive uh, international companies in Germany, which is again a sliver of interesting work, but I don't know if I should connect it with any hope. I'm rather skeptical, but I just do the work that I can, that I can do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, if I, if I summarize what I, what I heard, I mean, it seems for me you have a shared understanding related to humanistic transformation, but participatory and participating projects are very important and it's something to, to foster this. Still, you're, I heard four different narratives somehow about humanistic transformation. So I would question a bit what you said, um, Tom, that everybody knows what the humanistic transformation is. Maybe I get, Did get I say it, that? Maybe I get it wrong, or I want to get it wrong here to, <laughs> to, to go to... Because I think I, I will get to your question later. I think it's very important, and we are all here, not we only want to discuss, but I think we have you here as expert also what are concrete steps we can take. But I think before we do it, I would like to go back a bit to uh, what, we, what we heard yesterday. Yesterday we had Hartmut Rosa here as, a, uh, as, a, as, as one, and he started, he came in and shocked us a bit and said, oh, I, maybe it was wrong that I accepted to be here, but because I'm not the Hartmut Rosa I was three years ago. Now I'm much more, we are in war again, we are brutal again, there's mm -hmm. artificial intel intelligence, and, and, and again. maybe it's better if, if we human beings <laughs> are extincted. It's not the words he said, but I, I translated a bit. And, so, and, and you, um, Harald, you said we have to face certain challenges and, 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 and certain things. So I would like first to have for you a statement, where are we standing now? It's like, is, is there any chance for humanism? Is it, does it make sense this, that, that we still discuss about humanistic transformation? Or? Of course. Of course. I mean, I, I didn't want to be understood like uh, ish over, wie der deutsche Bundestrainer mal gesagt hat. Um, of course there's a chance, but there's also uh, taking, taking the expressions of Norbert Elias on the process of civilization. There's always a pot uh, potential and possibility of de-civilization. And the interesting and also the empirically interesting aspect is Maybe it has something to do with generational experience. Uh, if the, the face of, um, of low violence in uh, human development 
takes three generations or something like this, then people don't know much about war and experiences like this. And then there's a tendency, uh, just because there's no experience and there's no imagination of what that means, uh, to do things that should be avoided, things like that. So we don't know this, but what is really puzzling me is the possibility of this process of de-civilization that might take place in in the current situation. This is something maybe I'm I'm too pessimistic, but as as a social psychologist who worked with historical sources, uh, I should uh, I, I think in the moment one should be very very sensible and sensitive about these anti-humanistic developments we see. And I repeat, also in language, also in political behavior uh, to, to members of different parties. And so we see a brutalization of the language and these habits. And maybe these are just slight indicators of what might come. Maybe it's just a phase and everybody turns back and thinks, okay, we were wrong, we will now follow the civilization path. But seeing uh, some politicians uh, in Germany and in the world, I would be not convinced that this would be, take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Frau Schwan. Yeah, I, I'm. I do not share your general analysis, because I would not dare saying that in general there is a tendency for more violence, for uh, more violent language, etc. Whereas, let me say, 10 years ago, there was less violence and less uh, all these uh, appearances. Because very often, we don't see what is undercover. So my theory is, for the individual as well as for the society, that we have always a potential of different um, possibilities. I mean, that is a pleonasm. So I mean, a potential of dynamics of forces. I have worked for a long while also on political culture. And together with, uh, German, with Polish and French colleagues, we tried to find out what uh, are the factors to change dictatorial societies as they have been formed during National Socialism and in, during Stalinism to change them into democratic societies as a democratic political culture. Because interesting, in the history of political ideas, you have always the change to the worse, but not the change to the better. It's probably because it's a man history. So um, um, the, 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 what we came out was, or what we, what we came out was, there is no definite change in none of the countries, France, Germany, and Poland at that time, the, the, the book appeared in 2005, I think, or six. But there are different um, priorities within these different potentials. It depended from the time, from the circumstances, etc. We know that also from other research, empirical research. And so presently, I see, of course, these negative tendencies, uh, but I see also very positive tendencies. For instance, there is much more serious interest now, and not only fashion-like, for a better participation. Uh, amongst those who participate, there is a very serious commitment to what they are doing. Mm -hmm. There are progresses in that field much more differentiated than it was before. And I suppose that your general uh, analysis stems from your view on not only the war in Ukraine, but also the reaction of Western governments on the, to the war of Ukraine. Because uh, you probably, maybe I, I take you wrong, but you probably see that this reaction is much too warmonger-like. Yes, and is not if not pacifist enough, etc. But this is not, I would say, the difference of being uh, humanistic or not. This is a difference of political analysis. I happen to consider myself as leftist, uh, etc. Also within my social democratic party in the 70s and 80s, I was considered right wing because I was anti-communist. 
But things change, and if you grow old enough, that is uh, just not so important. But I do not uh, I consider myself as a leftist, but I, as I was always tied also to Poland in better times, better political times, in the 60s and 70s last uh, uh, century, um, I see uh, those who are uh, underlining that you need, unfortunately, deliver weapons, and there is no present possibility to get to a, a peace talks with Putin. They are not more violent oriented. They are not uh, less humanistic oriented. They have another different political analysis. And that is, I think, legitimate. And I would not make a general diagnosis that things go wrong. Of course, we have the sign of a growing of right-wing parties, for instance, and of the loss of democracies. And still, I wouldn't say that in general, people are now regressive and more violent, but that they are exposed to challenges which they cannot really manage. And they are, have been exposed to these challenges by a false policy, economic and social policy since the 80s. I don't want to go on on, on that, but this is, I mean, uh, I, I see so many serious attempts to overcome this problem that I would never get pessimistic in the present situation. I, one can get pessimistic, of course, if one looks to the Ukraine, of course. But on the other hand, for the first time, people in the West and in the North understand that they depend on the South. I think this is a huge progress, political progress. They have always thought that here in Europe and in the, in, the, in the North, they are completely independent, they can do what they want. No, they depend on the South. And they are not always sympathetic with the regimes in the South, but they depend on the South. So this is also progress in experience, in understanding, maybe if you draw the good consequences, also in modesty. I try a little bit to provoke you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, we, in our talk in the morning, we already saw humanistic transformation is necessary, I think, related to a certain political view on the world, and especially um, regarding the war, it's clear you have not the same opinions. Still, I think we shouldn't go too much into it. And I didn't understand you like this. We probably won't solve this problem. It's, this is clear. But I mean, um, in my introduction, I will give the word to you. It's, it's not only the war, and I didn't understand you like only the war. You, are, or, or you mentioned language as well, and, and, and also you mentioned by yourself ChatGPT and, and brought this in. So, I mean, this is like the, the post humanist and transhumanist discourse is going to climate change, for example. There are these, we can, we, have the, the, we can see it like people are on the road, block the road in the moment, call themselves last generation, for example. What they, what they do, there's like um, discourse that. Um, it's 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 not before five minutes before twelve, but we already passed certain things. I mean, beyond the war, there are a lot of signs, of course, which which are used, and I, I won't personalize this in you, but which are embedded in kind of of narratives which say, well, there is no chance anymore for you, Muslim. I think one thing what what we want here with the, with this conference is like fight for a narrative for for a strong humanist narrative to fight against these transhumanist or posthumanist. Um, let's say narratives without any hope, because mm -hmm. bringing with hope into the thing. Uh, Eric Fromm never called himself an optimist. Mm -hmm. He already said all, uh, already in his time there was this nuclear danger. For example, there were the, the blocks, and there it was to see that he, he wrote the book Revolution of Hope towards a humanized technology, where he stated all the dangers of, of, of technological de development. But still, he said being human needs to be connected with hope. And as, as, as long as we are humans, we have to maintain a, a kind of hope. So I think I wouldn't like to have the discussion, is it right to be optimist or pessimist? <laughs> I think there are a lot of, of dangers we face. And, and the question is maybe a bit also, what, what could be the essence of a humanist having this kind of? I didn't speak about optimism and pessimism. No. <laughs> I didn't speak about that. No, no, it was I don't think it's a good term. <laughs> Top. see that you, there are words on your list. Can I jump in or would you like yeah, to please. respond directly? No, no, I, I keep this a while. <laughs> okay. uh, first of all, I hope I didn't say that uh, everybody knows everything about humanistic transformation and there is no need to talk about it anymore. I hope I didn't say that. Um, my, um, 
my point is rather, I'm not sure whether more understanding about is conducive to the manifestation or the flourishing of humanistic transformation, so to say. Um, I want to give an example because I really resonated with what you said about the presence of fear and how fear guides certain processes and how participation might be also a way to contain the fear, so to say, and give people a chance to step out of that sense. Um, and you mentioned that we are hosting this reflection and dialogue space in the context of the conferences of the UNFCCC, the climate negotiations. What I'm, what I'm experiencing there is obviously huge frustration with the political process and so forth and so forth, for good reasons, a lot of frustration. When we are hosting our small sessions, there are a few examples I would like to bring into the space. One was a conversation um, among a person from Israel who had spent most of his life in the US, three ladies from China, and one young politician from Burundi. And you could feel before the first word was spoken how much was in the room in terms of what is present here, yeah? in terms of not only fear, but also prejudgments and anticipations, what would come just from the presence of these three Chinese ladies. Yeah? Um, and it didn't take very much, but it took a little bit of inviting into a certain form of space that something humanistic just happened by itself. So I guess I'm very much opposed to the idea that transformation can be done. I believe the humanistic dimension of transformation finds its way by itself if it is somewhat properly invited. And that has a lot to do with the containment of fear that is very natural and also human. Yeah? And, but then it doesn't, it doesn't need so much. I would say it is intrinsic to the human. You also emphasized that part of it. No, you spoke about the intrinsic dimension. And that dance between the intrinsic and the conditions yeah, is something very, very sensitive and tricky in a way. Um, the other example that I would like to mention, and then I come to, back to the original point. In the other session, there, was, uh, there were two negotiators, one from, again, Israel and one from Saudi Arabia. And in that session, we, we facilitated a few of small group conversations as part of it, and they happened to be in a small group conversation. And the two ladies ended up crying and hugged each other. And when we came back into the circle, she said, I've been in this for 25 years, and this is the first time that I actually speak with someone from your country. And that was so stunning. I mean, all that we are, what we are doing there, we are really not the super experienced psychodynamic facilitators. Yeah? We are really learners coming from a scientific background concerned about socio-ecologic things. It, but it happens by itself because they met as human beings. Um, and what that all makes me end up with is I feel a simultaneity of, you could say, the hopeful aspects of the transformation that is going on all the time at the moment, and the really depressing and concerning elements of transformation. It's like they coexist and co-develop at the same time. And I find myself in that struggle, like, where does my perception go and which, which leadership energy in me is nourished as, I exp as I'm a subject of that transformation? And I, I always, yeah, I struggle with my attention is guided to certain dimensions of reality while others are neglected. But I, don't, I cannot judge what is the majority. All I experience is once it's invited, Miracles happen that feel like humanistic transformation alive and nobody in the room has a profound understanding of humanistic transformation. But it, it needs to be invited, but it takes place clearly in the context of a very depressing surrounding reality and of phenomena that are happening that have the capacity to really uh, yeah, suffocate all humanistic flourishing that wants to happen. Oof, I, I feel that's just our task, and it's probably been like that for hundreds of years. I don't know whether reality was ever different. But, yeah, nourishing those energies in us that have the power to lean towards that intrinsic humanistic element that is in, in life, so to say. Um, that's where I stand. I, I pause here. I'm, yeah, I hope I stimulated something.
Do you want to <laughs> comment? Yeah, but I have to comment to <laughs> two totally different things. <laughs> uh, I agree totally uh, to you, and I think um, it is it is what makes us confident in that things can change to be better. And uh, I also um, I th I'm thinking about good places, inviting places. Uh, that that bring up the conditions that people can meet and have this experience and so on. And I think this is a dimension that is totally missing in the complete discussion about socio-ecological transformation because this discussion is a technical discussion and is not a cultural discussion. Therefore, I totally agree with you and I'm very, very interested in concepts like beauty, like begegnung, like place making and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but this is something totally different to what Gesine said. Um, she is the real problem. Hmm? And she is the real problem. <laughs> no, she isn't the real problem, but you wanted to provoke me. So therefore, <laughs> therefore I, I want to answer briefly. Um, my statement was not about the Ukraine war alone. But if we see, and it came out yesterday, the new data from, from the Swedish Institute of Violence Research, we had the last years uh, a huge increase of uh, victims of wars and things like that, not only the Ukraine war, but also Yemen, Ethiopia, and all these things. And we have, of course, many, many data uh, where we cannot be so confident that this civilization process, we have, we have simply, we have an increase of numbers of people that are killed, we have an increase of money that invests, is invested for war things, and we have this immediate mind shift in European countries for whatever reason, maybe that is something that we have to investigate, but and we can discuss it later in the S-Bahn in detail, um, because we have, of course, different perceptions on that. But what is puzzling me, and what is frightening me somehow, is that there is something going on that is not fitting into my perceptions of an ongoing civilization process. Of course, this is dialectically, and you can see on different levels different phenomena. And to, to say another uh, thing with Erich Fromm. I mean, Erich Fromm uh, guided the only research project that made an institution change their perspective. And this was the study he did uh, about the workers and the clerks and their mindsets concerning politics and things like that. And when the results came out, the, the, the institute decided <laughs> to go away, to, to immigrate. And this is something, I mean, we always have the ten tendency, and this is Norbert Elias again, the tendency to interpret our situation by wishful thinking. This is what we always do. And my work is a little bit related to try to see it also from the opposite angle because this might be politically more fruitful than to have this wishful thinking. So, and therefore, Eric Fromm is a very interesting example, the early Eric Fromm. Well, um, interesting. Uh, I would like you to put yourself in 1935 and possibly in Germany and you see that a very dangerous political party is rising up. Recently they had, uh, they had the opportunity to nominate the chancellor of the country, or the, what was that back then? Chan chancellor? Right? Mm -hmm. nee. Whatever, the, the director, director of the country, whatever. So now you see that this party is gaining ground. You see that your neighbors are becoming members of that party, and you as a humanist, you understand that this is a dangerous course. And in the next 10 years, you see the total decay of that society. You see that the war is coming to your own country and you have sort of seen it coming, but you could not prevent it. So what is your personal choice? You see that society as such is crumbling to brutal uh, 
to brutal forces and you need to remain, you, you feel the need to remain a humanist, a, a human friendly being. It is a tough choice. People have been in concentration camps and have stayed honest human beings while others have collapsed. So what I would like to emphasize with this example is it is always a question of personal attitude and personal courage. And at the same time, you depend, we all depend on societal structures. And a sliver of hope, for instance, is after the end of the Second World War in Germany, when the capitalist class was dismantled and powerless, then the constitution arose with a bekenntnis, with a yeah, with an pledge, with a pledge for humanistic values. And um, upon these values, we have created, I would say, a very pretty, pretty good society. We are still not. I would say completely democratic. I still see plutocratic influences wherever I look. So maybe we are now in a different situation, in a similar situation that, as you say, our, our societies go downhill. We live through dark times that may well happen. I would not exclude it. But the, the, the choice is still yours. How you behave yourself, how you keep up your, uh, your humanistic attitude and what, you, what, what influence you bring into the institutions that you work with. Uh, economic institutions and political institutions. And that is all our responsibility. And yes, we can lose this thing, but we will regain it. I'm pretty confident about that. <laughs> Humanity will rise upon the structures of maybe another decay. <laughs> I liked your perspective, putting us in the 30s last century, because I think the comparison with the 30s last century shows that there is a difference between the German society in the 30s and the German society now. This is not once for all given, and I never had the idea that we are in progress once forever and we don't, we don't have to fear any uh, uh, break. No, of course. I, this is not my general view of the world, that we will go on and go on and all things will be, get better. No. There, we will have backlashes, etc. But first of all, I agree with you, it's the question of attitude. But it's not only that. I mean, I don't think that we will have a difference of attitude, the two of us, but a different view on reality. And I try to follow a little bit that that discussion would be easier for me in German, this Kant's uh, position of Ideen einer Geschichte in weltbürgerlicher Absicht. That means the idea that history will have a progress in the sense of cosmopolitanism. And he does not say that this is very clear that history goes this way, but that there are developments which can encourage you to pursue your normative aim of weltbürgerlicher Absicht so that you should not lose totally your hope. This is a different perspective and this is my perspective. I would never expect from reality that it would support my um, good future views. No, of course not. But there are signs which can encourage us, and this is very different from wishful thinking. There are signs which can encourage you that you say, no, it doesn't all go down the street. But there are alternative signs, there are bad signs, but there are also other signs. And you have to discover them, because otherwise you get into a historic pessimism, cultural pessimism, and Fritz Stern has, has shown to us what that means if you get into cultural pessimism. It's, it's not my analysis of what you said, but the picture is, and I understood you this, the same way, the picture is more mixed. And there are awful tendencies, the way the language is used in our social media, the way attacks are going on, on uh, persons is not known 20, 30 years ago, but maybe they were undercover here in the heads. They were not known, but they were maybe in the heads. It's a potential. Uh, there might be... I'm not so sure that they are just all provoked to, 
by these social media, but maybe you have empirical findings which show that. But my point is, um, it is an attitude point. It is not an empirical derived point. It is an attitude point, but it helps to get to reality without any wishful thinking, but without also to get into total depression, because if you want to make a series of pessimistic views on the world, I mean, you can start at 8 o'clock in the morning and you can end up at midnight. Of course, this is not difficult. To find the other signs, to find the other end, by this also to contribute to constellations, and I see there a similarity with the, with the three of us, constellations in which people would not react in that bad, uh, violent, etc. way, but where they would react in a generous way, in an open way, create such situations. This is, of course, I think, what we have to do. And I have just during the last year and a half made very good experiences with such constellations where suddenly people and they see it with themselves, they, con they discover that with themselves. People who were very aggressive, very pessimistic, etc., open themselves. So this is always a possibility, and this is what I would plead for, and not to see it in a total pessimistic way. Okay, I think for me it seems that you all four ag agree about this, this point. I was asking about what might be an, a narrative for Humanist and, and, and you all four, and I, I include you as well when you when you answered to Tom, see, if I understand it right, see this nourishing, you, you, you told us, participatory, incentivizing, having, going with the right attitude to, to people, and you, you all, and I think you all um, narrate positive experience. I think this is something which, which for me, has an as aspect of, of hope and, and, and relates to from as well, to, to go into this kind of um, relational aspect and, and, and to highlight it. Okay, and, and I think, in fact, we agree and um, uh, the establishment of our foundation 12 years ago, the foundation Futur 2 has exactly this idea uh, that we are talking. So there's no dissonance here on the panel. But the other thing is, taking again the example of the 30s, 1930s in Germany, um, the... Um, the really hmm, problematic thing was in this phase from 1933 to 1941 was, because this was then the situation where the um, extermination of the Jewish people started, really. The first phase was the Ausgrenzung, the, the criminalization, the... Um, throwing people out of their jobs, but 1941 the real extermination started. With a non-Jewish population in Germany, the, what is the word for Zustimmung? Agreement. The agreement or the affirmation with the dictatorial system and with Hitler and the Nazis was ever increasing. Yeah, uh, With the tendency of dehumanization with uh, the tendency to extermination with all these things. So there was a process that happened to people uh, where they changed their mindsets, their behavior, their attitudes in the, in the direction of anti-humanism in a very concrete sense. And this is something that I find really, really interesting is not the right word, but we have to think about this, that this is possible because the people who were changing their minds would still have thought of themselves as good people, of people who read Kant and come from this uh, country of Dichter and Denker and things like that. So none of them thought, I'm, I'm a really bad person now. Yeah, because they had the ability to integrate the anti-humanistic thing in a kind of new society with a new thinking. And I agree totally, Germany in the year uh, 2023 is not at all comparable to 1933. But um, 
we, we, should be, we should be sensitive to these processes. I think this is very important and this is completely independent of this type of discussion we had before where we agree upon that there is hope and that people can uh, act towards each other in an adequate way and very, very humanistic. But there are anti-humanistic tendencies on a greater level and that influence people uh, um, into the, the other direction. This is my concern. Before you start, I would like both of you, and then I would open the panel. Mm -hmm. Rainer Funk also raised the hand, and then I will give you the chance because there are a lot of from experts, and it would be <laughs> nice to get into dialogue. But first, yeah, uh, I believe the elephant in the room in this discussion is how we use power. And uh, Hartmut Rosa touched on the subject yesterday as well, uh, because if you want to have resonance, true resonance you need to give up a power relationship. And giving up power, of course, is challenging for people in power. And what we have seen after the Second World War was that the ruling classes have lost their power. The uh, captains of the industry were uh, Nuremberg, processed, uh, condemned, killed sometimes. And the political class was completely um, dis encouraged and disenfranchised. Um, so there was a vacuum of power and that vacuum allowed humanistic spirits to thrive. And I believe that is also the challenge of today because when you look into families, when you look into enterprises today, you always see still the dominance of power relationships and our entire society is based on power and force. Our relationship with the Global South is based on power and force. And I believe that is uh, the, the relevant challenge for each one, uh, sort of any moment, when you feel that you are in a position of power to reflect and not to use the power, which is always a challenge, or when you feel that you are submitted or uh, uh, <coughs> sub submitted to by someone else who uses their power against you, you need to find a maneuver to neutralize or to counter this move. And I believe what we see with in, in the political struggle in our society, it's, it's always the AFD is thriving because they emphasize using power against uh, other people in society or whatever, they can be uh, out of racist consideration or whatever, they can be ostracized. So the use of power, I think, is very central to being a, a humanist. Ooh, there's, a, there's a lot in the room now <laughs> and tons of thoughts and associations in my mind. I'm curious what I will say now. <laughs> um, first off, somehow... My, I think my understanding of you shifted when you reflected on kind of a counterpart to the wishful thinking. That makes a, a lot of sense to me and somehow I'm still digesting that because there is a, I also see that need, that there is a, an either or between the one-sided wishful thinking and kind of the emphasis on everything is going downhill, so to say. Yeah? And both are very present and I totally agree there is a need to counterpart the wishful thinking that just ignores large parts of reality to create a positive good narrative, yeah, very clearly. So that's still working in, on my mind and I can't fully respond to it. Um, but I, what I feel like adding is I can't hide that there is a natural scientific side in me in my understanding of transformation. I am very much shaped by the understanding of complex system science. and. In that understanding, I would say it's so important for me to not refuse power as a quality that is present in systemic constellations. I think that's something that for a large part of my life I refused power. I connotated power negatively. And I think also that has shaped probably my, my experience as a German with all that baggage of the Third Reich, etc. in the background. That Power is the pathway to misuse of power and to power over others and not the sense of power as a relational quality with. So um, 
I perceive strong tendencies in the discourse around transformation to reproduce kind of the drama triangle of Karpman. You know, it's like uh, there are victims in Constellation and then you want to be the savior, but you might overwhelm yourself and then you turn either yourself into a victim or you become the perpetrator because you're so frustrated that you can't save the world and you can't save those people, etc., etc., etc. So transformation, in my understanding, is a change of relationship patterns across all sorts of systems. And then that has an institutional dimension, of course. Of course, institutions create conditions that also guide systemic emergence and self-organization processes. And at the same time, as agents in the system, each of us is personal subject with an attitude, a mindset, etc., contributing to the design of conditions. Yeah, like even in a, like, as the little research group leader that I am, there is a little bit of power maybe that I have to create small conditions in my context. Systemic, like thinking of humanism as a color of transformation, so to say, that runs through all layers of systemic hierarchy and power dimensions. Human, uh, what do I want to say? Um, the flourishing of human, humanistic transformation for me means that the different layers of power connect with each other along resonant relationship patterns. Um, so that it's not transformation as kind of I change something in somebody else's context. That is what I often witness, this wish to... We are concerned about a huge dimension of transformation. That's so easy to be pulled into changing something out there which is super big and very disconnected from myself. Focusing on my relationships and seeing humanism as the color in which I shape and live my relationality does not mean to disconnect from that large level, but engage in relationships across all systemic levels. And actually, I wanted to start with that now. I say it at the very end. Right before our meeting, I came out of a gathering of our little community of practice um, people, one from India, like there was a lady from China who is working with farmers, there's a former EU commissioner, very, very different layers where these people are active in the system, so to say. And none of us has kind of the power to change the system, so to say. None of us has the power to change this and that institution, him or herself. But we engage in a conversation that allows us to practice different relationship patterns and bring that into the different fields where we have a little bit of leadership. And that for me is a positive attitude towards power as a catalyst to create safe spaces where something can emerge in our relational context. There's certainly tons of things I didn't touch on, but I hope it was a meaningful kind of contribution at the end before we open it. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sure we could continue here. You yeah, could yeah, have a lot so to say, a lot of, uh, it's a really fruitful discussion, but I would like to open now, as I had promised, to give you a chance, and Rainer, you had first, and then. I would like to add an um, aspect which so far uh, never was mentioned, but I think if uh, the problem is a humanistic transformation in a Freudian sense, then we cannot disregard the question of what is conscious and what is not conscious, mm -hmm. or what is repressed. And uh, uh, to, to look at our mindset, or to speak with from, at our social character orientation, which uh, is determining our thinking, feeling, and acting. Mm -hmm. And there I want to start with an observation I made just before as a psychoanalyst. To all the statements, there was applause, but not to yours. Um, I'm, I'm used to it. Because <laughs> yeah, you, you said a threatening, you spoke of a threatening reality, that there is a regression in our uh, society or in our civilization uh, development, and uh, our mindset is only, we want only hear good yeah. news and not critical and not, uh, we, we do not want to be confronted with destructive fantasies there. 
So I think um, if one would put uh, what you said about the regression, if one would put this in the words of Fromm and not of Norbert Elias, both were pseudo colleagues in Heidelberg, it's the same Jewish uh, Zionist student movement. Um, if one would put it more in front, one could say uh, what now happened and what, what came up is that there was a, 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 a huge amount uh, of repressed destructiveness. And so we have to, to see normally we are able to cover it up. And now in this situation, this very critical situation of the war, we observe that for many people, they have only one solution, more destructiveness, more destructiveness. And I would say it's not a regression. It is a situation which Fromm very often mentioned, that in critical situations, what was repressed so far, and what, what, what has smoothened our and made good our living together comes to an end and uh, all the destructiveness gets, comes uh, to the service there. Now, nevertheless, I would, I would also agree in, in what you said, Christina Schwan, uh, that we should not think in questions of optimism and pessimism. And it was from who said there is an inherent, very strong striving for biophilia, for, for developing all our human potentialities. But I think we should not ignore the repression which is going on in our very capitalistic and very destructive and very competitive society. There is such a, 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 a huge amount of destructiveness covered up by the market and so on, and by them mm -hmm. who are winners and, and so on. I think well, we should have this in mind uh, that we have to see what is repressed in our society and how we can reduce the, um, the necessity to, to cope with this destructiveness in such a refreshing way. That would be my answer. Mm -hmm. And it makes it much more complicated, the question of a humanist transformation, if you, if you take in account what is repressed. But I do <coughs> not give up the hope that this very strong biophilic tendency has a chance mm -hmm. also in our society. Mm -hmm. So far. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank, thank you, Rainer. My idea is now we will have first a round because this was quite an intense comment. So you, if you want to comment on that, no, no collect. Just take no? them together. Look at them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then you manage it. Uh, 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 there were at least around. seven or yeah. eight, eight yeah. hands up. I mean, you can't <laughs> okay, then we, answer. Then I, uh, I have to take notes. Democratic, <laughs> I have new rule, we collect um, and the comments. Um, first of all, well, is someone or Gert, thank you very much if you pass the microphone. Okay, uh, Sandra, please, thanks. Thank you all for this very much. Um, my understanding of Brom when he says uh, we should expect the Messiah every day even though he hasn't come, is that hope is not based on evidence altogether. We could find evidence for an optimistic or a pessimistic point of view about right now. But hope is not about evidence. Uh, living with hope is a better life. It's an attitude, as I think you said. And uh, we, we can always find uh, evidence for the optimistic or pessimistic point of view. Thank you. So I have a, a comment, and that I was at uh, Epcot the day it opened, and it was an amazing time for humanity because the whole world was 
visionary, and I've got a pile of books on visionaries, and they have to be at the right place at the right time, because there's lots of amazing ideas out there, but they just don't have the possibility to materialize. And also, on prom being forgotten, there was a lady back in the 80s who wrote a book on transformation called The Aquarian Conspiracy. And uh, it's just amazing stuff out there, but mm -hmm. we need to use it. Also, <laughs> Gehen wir das wieder zurück. Der Benjamin hat. Der Herr mit der interessanten Frisur hatte sich auch nochmal gemeldet. So, I want to make two points because on the one side, when I look at our world at the moment, so we have one problem that maybe we have the third world, uh, third world war and it will go three seconds and after this we have a big problem. Or we have, I don't know, 30, 40 years left before the climate change will make us really big problems when we don't change uh, something in a real radical way. And when I understand from it the right way, also like in to have or to be, there was not um, the opposite between to be optimistic or to be pessimistic. It was like what I would call a a healthy kind of cynicism. So to look at the problems in a very clear way and to face it, and on the other side to uh, to believe in the uh, biophilic um, potential what we have. And so I mean, when I look at from and to have or to be, it was really clear what he criticized, and he also said in this book. Okay, we have two op options. The one option is we are all blowing us up. Or well, the other option is we learn to create a new world. And so I think there is not definitely a point between uh, to be optimistic or pessimistic. Okay. Um, I think there's someone who's three times called. Someone um, raised their hand? More? Ja, jetzt tut das nicht mehr. Okay, so then. Any other comment or otherwise I would. Yeah, okay. One more and then maybe. Yeah, thanks for all the contributors. Uh, contributors. I could uh, also. Uh, yeah, deeply agree with every argument you have nearly. But I want to strengthen to strengthen uh, Reimer Funk's uh, argument. We have talked so much ab about of uh, local, individual, and other attempts to counteract those destructive tendencies, and we have little, I think, a little bit forgotten uh, the system around it that uh, is very responsible for this destruction. And I mean, it is not only, but it is the capitalist uh, system. And why? Uh, my thesis, the deep ideology of the capitalist system, as Rainer Funk has mentioned, uh, is a deep social Darwinist uh, thinking that is deeply anchored also in the human potential, uh, in this time of the human potential for the bad, for the destructive. And I, I have not heard much, I have heard a little bit, and it's good, those group dynamics and organizational development. How can we counter this ideology that on one day uh, is uh, about freedom, democracy, about autonomy of self-employed and so, and can change? like Harald Walzer has mentioned, I think, within months of international crisis in deep social Darwinism and then in fascism or Stalinism. Yeah? How can we counter this ideology in the everyday, in every company, in every corporation? For me, this is a big question of humanistic uh, transformation. And, it, and I, I'm looking for Solutions I haven't found it. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Yes, I will uh, use opportunity. I really don't know how to put it in context, but uh, perhaps I will just uh, say like raw uh, as it is. And uh, <laughs> the thing is like, you know, um, I'm just like, uh, when yeah, Germans say you mostly compare to the Second World War, and I take my experience to the slavery as I was to back in the colonized time, and um, I do I do something very important that we most of the time is just uh, we don't put our view upon it, and that is a big heritage that we have. And then, uh, there were, for example, like kind of when you see the back in the slavery time, and uh, people that uh, put in one place another, but it's still like what role social social uh, destruction, financial destruction, racism, and everyone all this stuff. And in the middle of this content, we uh, as human we, we are able to rebuild an inner orientation, an inner um, personality. And that's for me, that's a sign, that show how strong we are as human. And we, and actually, I, I know I do think we, do, we have to see this as a human heritage. We also have in this kind of heritage and uh, not only destruction, like all, not only cultural heritage, but we do have also a human strange heritage that we have, that we have in us. And it's show like uh, after the Second World War that we do another stuff, and uh, we do like uh, the new uh, call of new countries overseas and on and so on. These are the proof that we have it, and uh, a lot of times this, this kind of heritage just go under. And just what I want to say, I don't know how to put a conscience, but I just say just raw it is. Okay, I think no more hands and. It's enough to discuss. <laughs> Who wants to start? I can start. Um, the, trying to bring some of these, especially the last aspects, together. There was an interesting uh, speech that Luisa Neubauer, a young German climate activist, gave on a conference, uh, on a huge, huge capitalist conference last week in Hamburg. It's a conference for all these marketing and PR persons, a very cult event. Everybody is proud to be a speaker there and whatever, and there are all these people who earn a lot of money and are very creative and clever. And Luisa Neubauer gave a brilliant speech that ended up with, um, with the claim that everybody in the audience should quit their jobs <laughs> and go to NGOs, go to organizations that would find for uh, better climate policies and all these things. And it was really interesting because none of these people were ex ex expecting something like this. And then they, of course, applauded because immediately they wanted to be the good people, that's clear. <laughs> but what was very interesting, and I liked this speech very much because it was um, a speech about responsibility. It was a speech about responsibility. And as long as we have the privilege to, to live in an open society, uh, to live in a free society, uh, every one of us has the possibility to be responsible and not only in the private sector but also in the jobs or in the public situations and this is something to my, to my opinion uh, what makes me what gives me hope that this is possible and we did also research on on people who rescued people in the third reich it's also very interesting because there were in absolute numbers, it were not so many, but they, it gave, uh, the, the people existed who did something like this. So there's always an actualization and a need uh, of actualization of responsibility in given situation. And unfortunately, it's always much more likely that you would say, okay, this is not so important now, and I get into trouble, and, that I, and people don't like me, and they don't applaud to my talk, and whatever. But as, as long as you have the opportunity to take this responsibility concretely, this makes a difference. 
open end, of course, because there's no, uh, no guarantee that this might be successful. But this is the only way to keep societies open, to fight the destructiveness. Uh, I would disagree that it's always there. I think this can also be changed, but this is an academic discussion in the moment. Um, but it's about <coughs> fighting destructiveness and taking the responsibility as long as one can take it. And maybe this brings also the two different dimensions of our discussion together, you know, this a doom picture uh, of the total situation and the possibilities that we still have to do something. And this is something that, this is my political motivation to do something, because I can. Maybe, maybe I give you a very brief uh, story to this. Um, in 2015, uh, 2015, when we had this refugee thing in Germany uh, because of the war in Syria and all these people came here. It was a very interesting situation in Germany because there were so many people who wanted to help actively. And there was a relative immediate media discussion about these people don't want it and the Stimmung kippt and all these things. So we established an NGO called um, uh, 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 Initiative of the Gesellschaft, Initiative Open Society, and we did in every German city, in the bigger and the smaller ones, town hall debates with the question, welches Land wollen wir sein? Which country do we want to be? And it was very interesting that so many people came to discuss these things, to, to make political discussions in a very civilized manner. And in one discussion here in Berlin, with an audience of like thousand people or something, there was an uh, um, elder man who would, uh, um, wanted to say something and what he said was, I teach refugees how to repair bicycles. Why? Because I can. And this is really a real strong statement. We all can do things and this leads to the responsibility to use that what we can. And I think maybe this is something like, you know, the, the, the humanistic direction, yeah? to fight this anti-humanistic direction. Maybe somebody is applauding now, I don't know. Um, I would guess that if you would organize such town hall meetings, they wouldn't be smaller. They would be as big. No. It, yeah. I would, there, there has been, uh, especially with this turn of the government uh, policy during the last weeks, in order to find an agreement, there has been a lot of opposition, much more than there has been opposition before. This is my perception. Uh, second question, um, what, what would be the responsibility of a CEO of a big company. Would it be to say goodbye, I now join an NGO, or would it be, okay, I have understood that the big company has to behave differently. Of course, if you want to abolish capitalism, you can wait until you have abolished capitalism and you don't have to answer this question. But if you don't want to abolish, and I tend to have had these questions and research even, I didn't speak a lot of research when I started my academic career. As I do not believe in any sudden end of capitalism, I would say the responsibility would be to really consequently find out what would be the responsibility of the CEO. And that would not just mean one singular or one individual change. That would be immediately, if he thinks it through, a systemic change, of course, because then they would discover that a CEO of a big company has the co-responsibility for the well-being of our social and political community. This is the systemic difference. They cannot just say business of business is business, but they have to say business of business is to take over responsibility for the whole environment in which we do our economy. This would be, I would say, the responsibility. And um, 
I don't know if I got it right, but um, we have a lot of discussions since Afghanistan and the end of Afghanistan and then, of course, the Ukrainian war about what is the West? What is it good for or what is it best for? What, does it still exist? Shouldn't we just say goodbye of what we would call politically the West because of colonialism and all these things, Mbembe? And we have discussed that in our Commission of Fundamental Values. We have even written a paper. You can see, uh, if, you, if you Google it, you can f find it easily with SPD Grundwerte Commission. And I do not totally agree in order to go on with these discrepancies that um, the, the uh, transformation is only discussed in technological and not in cultural etc. terms. It is of course discussed and we do discuss it, but there are certain political tendencies and they are very clearly located in the Free Democratic Party and in large parts of the Christian Democratic Party who try to say it's just technology and nothing else and we can do it without any problems. There are also some people in the Social Democratic Party who think that or who think well we should make it easier and therefore just speak about technological change. But I do not agree with you that the cultural sense is not discussed. It is uh, very highly discussed also in political realms. And uh, sometimes I have the impression that um, it is helpful to live in several worlds at once. I have I've never been a politician, uh, to just to say that. I have been, uh, I have, uh, been candidate for the presidency of the country, but this is not a typical political job. I have never uh, been candidate for any other political job. My life was within universities and, and uh, academia. But I always was involved in politics. I always was, as a part, party member, involved in the discussions of real politics. I was always involved in programmatical discussions. And if you are involved in two or three and four or five different role sets, you simply discover that it is not that easy. Because if you have these different roles, you cannot simply decide that's it. And this is my way. And you cannot simply decide the other world doesn't interest me because anyhow they are superficial, they don't see what is happening. It's, easy, it's not easy, but I found it always much more interesting to live at least in five different worlds. I would like to connect with your last statement about the, what is the challenge of, or what is the task of the CEO. And uh, as far as I see it, CEOs are um, agents of change as long as they are permitted to change something. The real power rests with the ownership. And that is the thing that we often overlook because ownership of large companies is very well hidden between uh, or behind a screen of uh, anonymous uh, uh, shareholder ownership. But we do know that the distribution of um, vermögen, uh, property, the distribution is very, very focused, very centralized in all over the place, all over, uh, all over the globe. And these are the people we would need to address. And that is hard because they do not act publicly. And the companies that we work with, with humanistic transformation, these are owner, privately owned companies where you can access a person where the owner or the owner family has a personal ethics and they are open for change. And with the large corporations, with this kind of distributed ownership or seemingly distributed ownership and uh, pension funds investing and asking for their return, I would say that is the surface, that is the cover up even in a way. And what really is relevant is the high concentration of ownership and these owners are not taken to task. They, do not, they are not responsible to anybody than their own interests. They have tax havens, they have yachts where they can sail the world without any control of any authority. 
and we need, in order to <laughs> humanistic transformation, I, I sometimes think we do depend on their personal transformation before they open up the gates for a uh, corporate transformation. And here I must confess, I'm, I'm really helpless. I don't know how we can change the consciousness and the, the political interests or the, the, the economic and the political interests of the powerful 0.01%. Maybe you have a better answer or an idea. Thomas, before you start, we're coming a bit mm -hmm. close to what and we will, you will tell. If you want to have a final statement, we will give. Otherwise, no. um, we will continue <laughs> afterwards. If you are also invited, we will have some finger food and drinks. But then you have the, the honor of a final. Oh. oh. <sighs> yeah. You don't need to. I mean, no, 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 there are a few <laughs> things I would like to say. <laughs> Um, yeah, because again, there are several loose threads in the air, like, and I would like to weave something into it. I'm still sitting with what you said, Anna Funk, about the oppression of the destructiveness. Um, because the, the question that came to me when you said that was like, where is it contained? Where are the spaces that are safe enough so that that oppressiveness that, or that destructiveness that's part of the human being, so to say, can be acted out and held, so to say. Is there, and I would, I would say as a normal social agreement, part for that in the way how humans relate? Can we contain that in our relationships, in our friendships, in our colleague relationships? Or is there such an element of threat from that oppressive dimension that we have to kind of outsource it yeah, to all sorts of um, manifestations of systemic nature. Yeah, that's, that's what I sit with as a struggle. And my aspiration is to create small spaces where that can be part of life, so to say. And my surprising experience is it creates joy. When people engage in that dimension of being human together without a certain shame, yeah, but with a oh yeah, good that we acted that out. And suddenly somebody starts laughing and the, the joy and then also the trust building are so close to the experience of certain playful aggression, so to say. It, so I, but I'm experimenting with it. I don't have a real answer to it, but I'm clearly, my, my sense is that there is a systemic outsourcing of that dimension of human life and that is what we suffer from, so to say. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a therapist from China, <laughs> we had a conversation about collective trauma recently and she provoked me with a thought and she said, we, we talked about community and she said, what is it that makes us build community? Couldn't it be that community also grows around the shared experience of trauma? That a collective identity emerges from having shared a very painful experience together and then being invited to process it together. Isn't that also part of forming community? Not only we have a party together and we're sharing some joyful experiences, um, but that always means that the reflection on that traumatic past must be invited and somehow collectively be contained. I'm saying collectively contained because I'm, I'm somehow frustrated with outsourcing containment to therapeutic settings, so to say. Yeah, that's, that's only one dimension of containment. And I, but I think there is a huge need for social containment as a normal element in relationships. Um, and that brings me, Kalu, to your comment about heritage. Um, in these encounters that I described just briefly from the climate conferences, there's a lot of different heritage brought into an encounter of humans from all parts of the world. And I would say mostly that is also loaded with pain and shame and guilt and what have you not. And with experiences of perpetrator identities and victim identities and so forth. And again, my experience is 
if that heritage is allowed to be present in the encounter, if it is okay to be there with that collective history, as shameful and painful and whatever it may be, something like a relief can take place. And, and that's kind of the back to the hope that you mentioned, which also I agree doesn't need evidence. Then the biophilic tendency of the humans in that encounter just takes over. But it really invites us to hold, hold the capacity to contain also that dimension that's always present when any human comes into an encounter. And that's painful. Um, ah, no, I don't say anything else about capitalism and the responsibility of CEOs and so forth. But I, I really believe in that intrinsic biophilic element. And I, I trust that as I am a human, I am life exploring what it means to be life. I believe that the living forces will be stronger anyway. And I'm curious about that. So I also trust that maybe we will experience more trauma in the near future collectively on various levels. But I feel as a living being, I am part of that learning journey, trying to be conscious. Let's see how far we get together. Um, yeah, and someday it will be over for me to experience that journey. I feel. Yeah, I feel there is a lacking discussion about mortality still, because that's part for me of transformation. But maybe that has space over the drinks afterwards. Yeah, because that shapes for me my understanding of transformation. I was <laughs> hoping you stop with curiosity, no, <laughs> not with mortality, but... Okay, I'm curious also about mortality. We have enough drinks, so you can drink until you know. <laughs> but, um, you're all invited. Thank you very much. I think the discussion, at least for me, was really inspiring. It was a lot of topics we discussed, and I think we found a way kind of resonance and the words of, of Hartmut Rosa and maybe also the humanistic spirit which we didn't fight here and didn't. So this was, I think, very... We oppressed that destructiveness in our discussion. Yeah, we can have this with the drinks. Yes. Now. <laughs> thank you very much and I hope you can be here and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>